Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our gravitation lecture. Now, before we begin, I need to correct some errors that I made in the previous face-to-face -face lecture. The first error that I have is in example 4.9. Now, in example 4.9, there's a problem in my working where I placed uh, uh, the potential as negative 120 times 10 to the power of minus 6. It actually should be 10 to the power of plus 6. So please uh, correct the error, which is on page 25 of example 4.9. Now the next error we have in the notes is the relationship between all the equations for gravitation. The error is that the force uh, is actually the negative gradient of the GPE with distance. Okay, So the negative sign is missing. So in order to get the force, you take the gradient of the gravitational potential energy and in order to get the gravitational field strength, you take the gradient of the potential. Alright, so now that we are done with the corrections, we can begin with our lecture. And uh, we stopped here at section 4.14. Now, I mentioned before uh, during the lecture that you can think about gravitational potential as a rubber sheet. Every time there is a mass in space, it pulls the potential down with it. All right? If there are no masses, then the potential will be even. That means zero potential. But the moment there's a, potential, there's a mass there, the potential becomes negative. So um, the gravitational field strength is the gradient of this rubber sheet. The steeper the gradient, the stronger the gravitational field strength. So let's take a look over here. The gravitational field strength at a point is the negative of the gravitational potential gradient at that point. Okay, so what does the negative uh, uh, sign mean? I'll tell you later. But let's take a look at this example first. Question 4.15. Estimating gravitational field strength from gravitational potential. The following table gives the values for gravitational potential due to the air Earth at various heights above the Earth's surface. So let's draw the Earth first. Here's the Earth. And we're going to draw the height above the surface. First, we draw 580 kilometers, 580 km. This will be the first point. Then the next point will be at 600 km above the Earth. And then the next point will be at 620 km above the Earth. Now, let's take a look at the gravitational potential. The gravitational potential here is minus 57.51. The next gravitational potential is minus 57.34. And the next gravitational potential is minus 57.17. Now, if you plot them on the graph of gravitational potential against the distance from the center of the Earth, you can see, uh, which is not to scale, 57.551 over here. This is at 580 kilometers above the surface. Then over here we have minus 57.34. And over here we have minus 57.17. So these are going to form a curve like that. Okay. And now we want to find out what is the, what is the gravitational field strength at a height of 600 km. Now to take the gravitational field strength at a height of 600 km, we need to take the gradient of this potential graph at 600 km. So how do we take the gradient of this potential at 600 km? Now one way is to take the gradient of the adjoining points over here. So if we take the gradient of this point, which is 620 and 57.17, and this point here, which is 580, 57.51, we will be able to get the gravitational field strength. So the gravitational field strength is a negative of the gravitational potential gradient. We can approximate the gravitational field strength by taking the points adjacent to the 600 km mark. So if you take a look at the working over here, the gravitational field strength is approximately equals to the gradient of the gravitational potential uh, for points that are on either side. So if you fill in the values here, 57.17, 57.51, multiplied by 10 to the power of 6, 620, 580, and 10 to the power of 3. We get a value of negative 8.5 newtons per kilogram. All right, so the gravitational field strength at 600 kilometers height is 8.5 newtons per kg. 
you can also write it as 8.5 meters per second squared towards the surface of the planet. Okay, so this is question uh, example 4.15. Now remember our diagram uh, of all the equations. Over here, our diagram here is force, then field strength. This is potential energy, and this is potential. The equations inside here are only valid for point objects. However, the equations on the outside are valid for all objects. Now, in order to go from potential energy to force, we will take the gradient of the potential energy with distance. Okay, and in order to go from the potential to the field strength, we also take the gradient or we take the negative of the gradient, we take the minus gradient. Okay, we can get the field strength. Now, how do we go the other direction? To go from the field strength to the potential, we can take the area under the graph. And the same thing from force to potential, we can take the area under the graph. Okay, because one of the, the process to go from down to up is differentiation. So the process to go from up to down will be integration. A graph of gravitational force against distance from the center of the planet is shown below. The magnitude of the shaded area of the force and distance graph is the work done by the gravitational force when the test mass rises from B to A. Now the work done by the gravitational force is negative and it also represents the change in the gravitational potential energy of the test mass. Now in the same way, the gravitational field strength against distance graph, the area under the curve is the change in the gravitational potential from B to A. Right? The change of the gravitational potential from B to A. Right? So um, once again, the gradient of the potential gives you the field strength. The area under the field strength gives you the change in potential. Okay. Now we're done with uh, question four, section four, and now let's move on to section five, orbital motion. Now in 1687, uh, Newton described how he conceived of the idea of orbital motion. Now imagine a very tall mountain on top of which is located a cannon. We have a simulation over here, all right, and there's a cannon on the top of the mountain. When I fire the cannonball, it will fire off the mountain and hit the ground. But what happens if I fire it at higher speed? At higher and higher velocities, it will go further and further away from the cannon. Now, can you imagine what will happen if we increase the speed quite a lot? Now, the ball will be able to go further and further. And if we increase the speed a certain amount, a certain amount, then the ball will be able to go around the earth and come back and hit the cannon in the back. Okay, so this is one way of shooting yourself. Okay, by making sure that you fire the ball fast enough. Okay, so that it comes back around. Now, if you fire it at higher and higher speeds, it will also perform this kind of elliptical motion. Okay, but with the with the end of the ellipse going further and further away uh, from the Earth. Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, Newton's idea. Now, Newton's idea is that every uh, path taken by the cannonball is an ellipse. The only thing that changes when you increase the speed of the, of the cannonball is that the far end of the ellipse, the major axis of the ellipse gets further away. Major axis gets longer. Right? So what happens if you go at escape speed? Now if you go at escape speed, right, then the major axis of the ellipse would be at infinity. Okay, so the end of the ellipse on the other side will be at infinity, so you go, you will be able to get away to infinity. So this gives us a way to do circular motion around the Earth. This is called a circular orbit. So the circular orbit occurs at a specific speed. If you go too fast, okay, if you go too fast, your ellipse will be larger. Uh, and then if you go too slow, 
right, your ellipse will be inside the earth. So this will be too slow. And then this is too fast. And then over here, at this particular speed, it's just nice for circular orbit. All right. So as the speed increases, the cannonball path will form larger and larger ellipses. Okay. Now, so Newton reasoned that orbital motion if, is possible if a body can be launched with sufficient horizontal velocity. Now, then won't you ask me, but teacher, aren't rockets launched vertically to go to space? Uh, no, that is actually not correct. To get to space, you go this way to space. Because what is needed to keep you in orbit is not height, but horizontal velocity. It's a common misconception that rockets are launched into space. Rockets only rise vertically at first to escape the atmosphere because otherwise there'll be a lot of air resistance. After which the rocket will turn sideways and increase the speed until it attains sufficient speed to stay in orbit. And that's why I like to start orbital motion with this nursery rhyme. What goes up must come down unless it goes around and around or flies with escape speed. Uh, I can't make the last part rhyme, so maybe you can find a way to make something rhyme, uh, the last line rhyme, okay? What goes up must come down unless it goes around and around or flies with escape speed. Now, now we're going to calculate the orbital speed needed for a perfectly circular orbit. There's only one speed that produces a circular orbit at every height. Now, the secret to finding out the orbital speed will be the gravitational force provides the centripetal force for circular motion. So what we're going to do is we're going to write the gravitational force, GMM over R squared, provides the centripetal force, MV squared over R. Now, we cancel out the small m's, we cancel out the r's, and then we get gm over r equals to v squared. Now remember, big M is the planet's mass, uh, and small m is the satellite's mass. Okay, so um, don't cancel out the wrong mass, okay? So the, we find that the uh, orbital speed needed for a circular orbit depends only on the planet's mass, and only on the what we call the orbital radius, okay? Now, how do we understand this uh, formula? It means that the closer the, plat the orbit is to a planet, the higher the speed needed to maintain a circular orbit. If you are orbiting very far away from the planet, then your speed will not be very high, okay? However, at every, at every particular radius, there's only one speed, okay, that will orbit. Uh, will produce a circular orbit. Okay, let's have some, um, take a look at some of the stuff that's orbiting around Earth currently. So, I have uh, over here a live view of the stuff that's currently orbiting in space. Um, the grey stuff is all junk. Uh, the red stuff and the yellow stuff are working satellites. Now you can see uh, Mr. Elon Musk has uh, managed to uh, launch quite a number of satellites across uh, in a line. These are all Elon Musk's Starlink satellites. Now let's take a look at the Starlink satellites. They are very close to the Earth's surface and they are traveling at 7,700 meters per second. So that's, that's plenty fast, huh? That's pretty fast. Okay, so the Starlink satellites are actually just above the surface of the Earth. If, if I zoom out properly, you can just see the orbits. Okay, now um, many of the orbits here are not uh, circular. In fact, many of the orbits are elliptical orbits. As you can see, this millennial orbit, uh, it's, a, it's a Russian satellite, so it has to spend more time okay, up in uh, the northern latitudes where Russia is. Okay, now if you take a look, you can see that the Earth actually has a ring around it. It's not a ring of nice rocks like Saturn, but actually a ring of space junk. Uh, these are the gra uh, geostationary satellites. Now, Intelsat 30 launched in 2014. The speed of this satellite is only 3 kilometers per second. So you can see that as you, as you orbit further and further away from the Earth, the speed needed for a circular orbit is much lower, right? 
compared to your Starlink satellites over here or this Delta One debris, where it's over six kilometers per second. All right. Uh, now let's take a look at uh, Singapore right now over Singapore. Um, the current time, of course, is in a Sunday afternoon. You can see that there's some debris going right ahead. Now, will this uh, satellites ever fall onto the Earth? Not likely. As noted by Newton's Cannon uh, experiment, if you're traveling with sufficient horizontal speed, okay, you're not going to fall towards the Earth. You just go around it, around it, around it, until eventually you slow down because of air resistance and you fall. All right, so let's go on to some interesting questions. It's often said that when a spacecraft is in circular orbit around the Earth, it is in zero gravity. Is this correct? No, absolutely not. The reason why the spacecraft is in orbit around the Earth is because of the Earth's gravity. If there was no Earth and no gravity, the spacecraft would move in a straight line and escape the solar system. So definitely not. If gravity acts on a spacecraft in orbit, why doesn't it fall to Earth? The gravitational force of the Earth on the Moon or on the, on the others or on space or spacecraft, right in orbit, or let's say spacecraft, uh, provides the centripetal force needed to keep it in circular motion. The, mo the, the spacecraft's velocity must be perpendicular to the gravitational force, and this gravitational force is just sufficient. To keep it in circular motion all right so this is a standard answer so if there is gravity in space and gravity is what keeps the uh, spaceships around the earth and the moon around the earth then why do astronauts in the spacecraft feel weightless so over here you can see an image of an astronaut on the international space station in orbit around the earth as you can see he's free floating in the international space station does that mean that he has no gravity acting on him? No, that's not correct. The reason why astronauts feel weightless on the space station is because the astronaut and the space station are falling towards the Earth with the same acceleration. Hence, there is no normal force between the astronaut and the walls or floor of the spacecraft. The astronaut therefore experiences apparent weightlessness. For those of you who are trying to understand how this works, now try to imagine that you are in a lift. This is an elevator with a cable, so this is a lift. Now, if I was to cut the elevator cable with a large pair of scissors, right, then the lift would start to fall towards the earth with an acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared. All right, and not only that, but the you inside the lift will also start to fall towards the Earth also at an acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared. Now, inside the lift, therefore, you will be experiencing what is known as free fall, where you actually will lose contact with the floor of the elevator. So, this state is called free fall. Now, astronauts and the International Space Station are also free falling towards the Earth, uh, and the acceleration of the astronaut and the space station is the same. So it is equivalent to you falling uh, inside a lift. That's why they feel no apparent weight. Okay. Now let's move on to the next part um, of calculating how long it takes for a satellite to make a circle around the Earth. Okay, so this is the this is the Earth, all right, and this is a satellite that is going around the Earth. The time it takes for the satellite to go around the Earth one time is called the period. Now the period is very easy to determine. Okay, the period would simply be the circumference of the orbit divided by the speed of the motion of the satellite. So the circumference of the orbit is 2 pi r and the speed of the satellite is v equals to square root gm over r. So we can easily put that the time required to go around in an orbit is 2 pi r divided by square root gm over r. Now after some fancy mathematics, we will be able to get t squared is equals to 4 pi squared over gm r cubed. There is another way to do this as well by using the centripetal force is provided by the gravitational force. So centripetal force is provided by gravitational force Instead of using mv squared over r, we will use mr omega squared. 
on the left and gmm over r squared on the right okay so um, then in that case uh, the r squared goes over to this side becoming r cubed all right and then the 2 pi uh, over t will be squared okay to get t squared equals to 4 pi squared over gm r cubed same equation as before now this is Kepler's third law this is called Kepler's third law Kepler's third law states that the square of the period of the orbit is proportional to the cube of the orbital radius well in English what it means is that the further away an orbit is from the planet the longer it takes to complete an orbit for two reasons the first reason is because uh, v is lower and the second reason is that the circumference is larger okay so not only does it have a larger orbital circumference but the speed that which is going in the orbit is also lower so that's a double whammy okay the further it is the orbit is from the sun or the planet the longer it takes to complete an orbit now let me introduce to you a very special type of satellite called geostationary satellites now geostationary satellites complete an orbit once every 24 hours all right now i'm going to show you a video about geostationary satellites this is a video of the geostationary satellites around a simulated earth okay now um they exist only in a very thin ring there's only one orbit around the earth which is geostationary and this orbit must be above the equator and going from west to east as you can see in the picture over here all right so all these satellites in a nice ring they look like they're going in a merry-go-round in a geostationary orbit around earth now why is it called geostationary orbit now if we take a top view of the planet you can see that uh, each particular satellite is always above a certain point on the earth's surface now you can see that there's a big gap over here why is that the case the big gap is because this satellite area is above the Pacific Ocean and as you know there are not many people living in the Pacific Ocean so it doesn't make economic sense to put a satellite there when nobody will use it so you can see that every satellite will orbit a certain point, point above the Earth's surface now the period of orbit is exactly 24 hours which is the same as the time it takes for the Earth to spin around its axis now why is this uh, important now just take a look at this uh, video over here now you see in this video all the stars seem to be moving are the stars moving no actually it's the earth that's turning around which makes the stars seem to move but i want to, you to focus on a particular points on this video that don't seem to move no it is not dust on your screen this is actually the um geostationary satellite in space so this point over here it looks stationary in the sky now if you look closely you can actually see the ring of geostationary satellites in this video the longer you look the more you realize that oh my goodness there are geostationary satellites in the sky right above our heads now just think about it you are in singapore right now if you look straight up there will be a ring of satellites going from west to east right above your heads that you can't really see that are always looking down on you yes this is what geostationary satellites are so let's go back to our um, notes over here a satellite uh, in geostationary orbit will a person standing on the surface of the earth will see the satellite stationary in the sky that is just hanging there now the conditions for geostationary orbit are that the period of the satellite is 24 hours which means it is, has some specific orbital radius. The satellite is directly above the equator and the satellite is orbiting in the same direction as the Earth's rotation west to east. Now, if the satellite is not directly above the equator, it will be in an inclined orbit. So this is a geostationary orbit on the equator. If it's not on the equator, it will be in an inclined orbit. Now, it is... If it's on the inclined orbit, then at 6 a.m. it will appear here, and then let's say 6, 12 hours later at 6 p.m. it will appear down there. So whereas um, for a geostationary satellite, it is always directly overhead. So let's say you're in Singapore over here, then the geostationary satellite will be right above your head. But for the satellite that's in an inclined orbit, 
it will be in the north and then after that at 6 p.m this is overhead but the satellite that is an inclined orbit will be in the south so imagine if you are in singapore and the satellite is not in the equatorial orbit the satellite will seem to move north and south above your head every 12 hours so that's quite annoying if you're trying to locate the satellite you'll have to keep moving your radar dish so what is the advantages of the geostationary orbit the geostationary satellite will appear to remain in the same position in the sky when observed from the ground this is very useful for telecommunications and weather satellites you just have to put your antenna facing the satellite and you don't have to move it for another 10 years because the geostationary satellite is always above your head now what are the disadvantages of stationary orbit the geostationary orbit is very far away from the earth it's like 36,000 kilometers so from that distance the earth actually is um, quite small and the resolution of any photographs taken from a geostationary satellite will be very limited now the next disadvantage is that geostationary orbits have to be on the equator so let's say you're in australia antarctica or maybe you're working in alaska or russia you will not be able to get very good reception from the geostationary satellite because you're very high far north and south of the equator now we're going to go to question, uh, example 511 which is the to determine the geostationary orbit radius for the earth the way to solve this problem is to use kepler's third law where t squared equals to 4 pi squared over gmr cubed for time for the time period we'll put 24 hours which is 24 times 3600 okay uh, and then we square it now and then for the mass we put the mass of the earth so this is the only two things that we need to substitute in the equation and after that we'll be able to find the geostationary orbit will be 42,000 uh, kilometers away from the earth's center now if you subtract away the earth's um, radius which is about 6300 km or is it 6400 km the geostationary orbit is 42,000 km meaning that the geostationary orbit will be around 36,000 km above the earth's surface okay right so this is where the geostationary orbit will be 6.6 .6 earth radiuses away now the next part of our lecture will be talking about the ke of a satellite in circular orbit now as you know satellites in circular orbit are moving at very high speed so this guy is going at 7700 meters per second which is like how many 20 30 times the speed of sound all right and even the satellites going at geostationary orbit are going at 3000 meters per second which is about 10 times the speed of sound these guys are moving really fast now how do we calculate the kinetic energy of a satellite in circular orbit now that's really easy since we know that the velocity of the satellite in a circular orbit is v equals to square root gm over r then the kinetic energy will be half mv squared which will just be half gmm over r okay since uh, v is square root gm over r so you know half mv squared gmm over r there's another trick method over here by using the centripetal force is provided by the gravitational force so if we write gmm over r squared is equal to mv squared over r do you notice that this is actually kinetic energy up here so we cancel off the r's and then we multiply by half we cancel off the r and we multiply by half then we get half mv squared equals to half gmm over r so the, the trick way of doing it using centripetal force is to realize that the top part of centripetal force can be made into ke very easily now next we're going to find out the total energy of a satellite in circular orbit meaning how much fuel um, is needed to get it into space now um, a satellite in orbit doesn't just have kinetic energy the satellite in orbit also has gravitational potential energy so over here we have low gpe and over here we have high gpe so um, this satellite in this orbit over here has got both ke as well as gpe and the ke plus gpe together make up the total energy the total energy te total energy te okay so the total energy in orbit is the sum of its ke and the gpe 
Now the kinetic energy that we worked out earlier is half GMM over R. Remember the, the, the part that we just did over here? And the GPE that we know from our, uh, our circular uh, diagram, this is the GPE, will be minus GMM over R. Now let's add these two together. The total energy will be the sum of the kinetic energy plus the GPE. Let's take a look. Half of this thing, GMM over R, minus GMM over R, gives you minus half of GMM over R. Oh my goodness. So actually, the total energy, kinetic energy, and GPE are related by a very interesting um, relationship. So basically what it means is that, let's take a look at what, what the values are. Let me give you an example. Let's say the kinetic energy is 50 joules. Then the total energy will be minus 50 joules. And then the GPE will be minus 100 joules. So you can see that there is a relationship between the Ke okay, and the total energy. The the total energy will just be the negative times minus 1 of the Ke and the GPE will be the negative double negative times minus 2 of the kinetic energy. This is only true for satellites in circular orbit. So a satellite in circular orbit will have a Ke, a GPE and a total energy that is in a locked a relationship okay, of uh, one of them will be a negative of the Ke will be the total energy and negative twice of the Ke will be the GPE. Okay, so this is how the values are related. Now, let's take a look at what we know about orbits so far. Here's a reminder of what we know about the orbits. Okay, so over here, this object here is moving fast. This object here is moving slow. That means that it has lower Ke. This object here has higher Ke. Now, this object here has higher GPE. This object here has lower GPE. And it's harder to get into this orbit. So this orbit here has got higher total energy, higher Te. This orb orbit over here will have lower total energy. Okay. So let's take a look at the summary. In when you go further from the orb, when you go further from the planet, when you are at an orbit further away from the planet, you will have a higher total energy because it's harder to get that far away from Earth. You will have higher GPE because the GPE increases further you are from the planet, but you have a lower Ke because you will be moving slower. Now, how do these relate in a diagram? This is a graph of the kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and total energy of a satellite in a circular orbit. Now, do recall that whatever kinetic energy you have, whatever kinetic energy you have, so let's say this kinetic energy is like uh, uh, 30. Okay, this kinetic energy is 30. Then the total energy will be minus 30. And then the total GPE, the, sorry, the GPE will be minus 60. So this graph tells you that close to the planet surface, close to the planet surface, the Ke is 30, the GPE is minus 60, and then the total energy is minus 30. Okay, minus 30. Now, what about if you go very far away from the planet? If you go very far away from the planet, your Ke is 4, your GPE, uh, your, your total energy is minus 4, and then let's say your GPE is minus, minus 8. So over here, you're going slower. So your Ke here is 4. Your GPE is minus 8. And your total energy is minus 4. Okay, so let's take a look at how you compare. So minus 30 to minus 4, your total energy has increased. Your total energy has increased. Minus 60 to minus 8 your GPE has also increased. And from 30 to 4, your Ke has decreased. Alright, so 
as you go uh, as you go to a higher orbit your ke will decrease your gp will increase and your total energy will increase now here's a question for you how much energy needed to get to infinity to get to infinity your te at infinity must be greater than or equals to zero so remember that to get to infinity you must have a total energy of zero and zero is a very large amount of energy so what happens if you have negative total energy a negative total energy means that a spacecraft is captured in the orbit of the orbit of the planet and cannot escape to infinity for the spacecraft to escape to infinite distance from the planet it must have a zero or positive value of total energy all right so that is uh, what we will end here for today okay the following parts uh, we will cover in a subsequent lecture once you come back from the september holidays now work hard during the holidays and i hope that you have a good time now uh, also after you finish this lecture video please do the lecture questions at the end of the video to prove that you have learned something from the video thank you and have a nice day